What's up family, Pastor Darius here and super excited about this message you are about to listen to. Listen to me. Uh, you're watching a message that's in a series of messages that I did on the book of Proverbs, which is intended to impart wisdom to the godly. I need to make wise moves in every season. So this message is called Smart Moves. It's a, it's a, a, a sermon that will hopefully help reorient the way we make decisions. And I'm excited about it. And I believe it's going to impact your life in an incredible way. Here's what I'm asking you to do. If it helps you in any way, would you just send it to somebody else? That's my only request. All right, enjoy the message. Take care. All right, well, we're in a series in the book of Proverbs, which is in a section of the Bible called Wisdom Literature. It's called, I'm Too Smart for This. I want to know, do the 1145 feel like talking back to the, to the preacher today? I want to read one verse found in Proverbs 12. Here's what Solomon says. He says this, the way of fools seems right to them. <laughs> but the wise listen to advice. Everybody, come on, say it. Say it to me. Don't say it to your neighbor. Say it. Say it. No, say it. Say it for yourself. Say it for yourself. Say, in this season, in this season of, my life, of my life, I will only make, will only make smart, moves. smart moves. Clap your hands if that's your confession. Smart moves. Well, family, you know I like to curate and create axioms because I believe axioms help us remember truths. And so I want to leap into this lesson with an axiom today that can be captured in the following phrase. Uh, it's coming on the screen and it's on the Change Church app and our website. All of our notes are there from each lesson at the end of every Sunday. Some decisions have the potential to produce a season. I should have got an amen right there. And some seasons have the potential to produce a cycle. Good decisions have the potential to produce good seasons and good seasons have the potential to produce good cycles, but bad decisions have the potential to produce bad seasons and bad seasons have the potential to produce bad cycle. Therefore, although all seasons are important, all seasons are not equally consequential. There are some seasons that matter more than others. I call these seasons pregnant seasons. Some of this, some of you are like, I'm in one of them right now. Yeah. A pregnant season is a season that has the potential to produce seasons. It is a time in life where decisions are like dominoes that become defining moments for us and determinants as it relates to our destiny. And all throughout scripture, we see examples of this family because when you find yourself, listen to this, in a pregnant season, pregnant seasons necessitate smart moves. I'm gonna say that one more time. Pregnant seasons necessitate smart moves. And the scriptures are inundated with examples of people who made smart moves in pregnant seasons. There is a woman who has a book of the Bible dedicated to her story. She's a strong sister, a smart sister, a savvy sister. Her name is Esther. She grew up on the other side of the tracks. She was orphaned. She was impoverished. She had to grow up real fast and real Real soon. She was raised by an uncle named Mordecai and by God's grace she went from the pit to the palace and she ends up marrying a king of Persia and the Bible is very clear she is enjoying this space and season in her life I mean she's in the palace now she's got maids she's got attendants come on she's got servants she's got chefs I mean she's just living her life can you see her she's very demure very cutesy 
mindful. Come on, I mean, she's just, she's, she, she is there. And then all of a sudden, she gets word from the man who raised her, watch this, who is not greater in socioeconomic status, but he's greater in spiritual stature. His name is Mordecai. He wasn't called to be in the palace, but he had an anointing for those that were. He's what we call a king or a queen maker. And Mordecai sends word to Esther. He says, Esther, we got a problem. There's somebody in the king's cabinet. He's a hater named Haman. And what Haman is attempting to do is he's attempting to obliterate our people. And the king is unaware. And so here's what I need you to do. I know the king is temperamental. I know the king is narcissistic. I know the king is someone that is unbalanced and unstable but I need you to use your influence to go to the king and tell the king to put a stop to this. I know the king don't care about us, but the king care about you. So I need you to leverage your influence with the king and I need you to risk what God gave you in order to achieve why he gave it to you. So Esther has to make a smart move here because she has to love why God gave her a thing more than the thing that God gave her. And we talk about her now. Thousands of years later, there's a book of the Bible dedicated to her name because in a pregnant season, she made a smart move. Because in pregnant seasons, you got to make smart moves. There was a man named Noah who also made a smart move. <laughs> when the Bible is clear in communicating that God tells him to build an ark before it rains. And Noah has to make a decision regarding whether or not he's going to engage in prophetic preparation and build an ark when there's no signs of rain. Not realizing and recognizing that your willingness to build the ark is an indication that you believe rain is coming. It doesn't take faith to build it when it's raining. But it takes faith to build it before it rains. Can I give you two words before I go to my next example? Build it. If you believe God's getting ready to do exceedingly and abundantly, build it. What's the art? The structure. B build it. Noah made a smart move. They called him silly when he was building it. They called him smart when it rained. There's a book of the Bible dedicated to a woman named Ruth. Who made a smart move. After the death of her husband, she is faced with the choice, do I go back to my hometown and to my homeland, or do I follow and stay and do life with my mother-in-law who has led me on a path that has actually improved every single area of my life? So she has to make a decision. She's got to make a smart move. Do I go back to the familiarity of a dysfunctional past, or do I have the faith to step into an uncertain future? And she's able to break free from the shackles of familiarity. And because she broke the fetter of familiarity and didn't go back to a dysfunctional past, she stepped into a blessed future where this woman named Ruth meets a man named Boaz. And Boaz changes her life and the generational trajectory of her bloodline. She made a smart move in a pregnant season. But y'all know I grew up Baptist. So I can't give you all those examples and not give you this example. Yes, sir. Jesus. Yes, Come on, 1145. Yes, Jesus yes, made a smart move. Yes, in the garden of Gethsemane, when he's faced with the agony of choosing between convenience and calling. Because I know we live in an age and an era where people are incorrectly assuming that everything about my calling is convenient. Yeah, but there are aspects of my calling that are inconvenient. There are aspects of my calling that give me agitation I feel like I don't need in this season. There are aspects of my calling that make me a little bit temperamental, watch this, and double-tongued when it comes to what I say about my assignment. In one season, I can be saying, destroy this temple and in three days, I'll raise it back 
back up again. But then on the night before that I got to go to that cross, I'll be like, now that I think about it, if it is possible, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, but he makes a smart move to choose calling over convenience because Jesus realizes that when you're in pregnant seasons, your response in pregnant seasons tests your faithfulness to God, but it reveals God's faithfulness to you. So if your faithfulness to God leads you to the cross, God's faithfulness to you will give you a resurrection. In pregnant seasons, I need smart moves. However, we don't know what season is a pregnant season, so we need to make smart moves in every season. And the book of Proverbs offers us some insight on how to do that. This text right here in Proverbs 12, Solomon offers us some amazing insight for those of us who are serious about making smart moves. He contrasts the fool to the wise. And here's what he says. He says, the way of fools seems right to them. Now, when he says fools, what does he mean? He's not saying unintelligent. He's not even saying unwise. He's saying someone that's operating with earthly wisdom. Come on, remember two weeks ago what we talked, what, what did James say? There's two types of wisdom. There's heavenly wisdom. And there's earthly wisdom, right? So heavenly wisdom, which is godly wisdom, isn't just right, it's better. Period. It's superior. Yeah. It's more reliable. It is timely truths that work in all times. Yes, sir. Isaiah says God's ways are higher than our ways. That's earth. And so Solomon says a, a fool, someone who operates with earthly wisdom, their ways always seem right to them. So they are unwilling to reconsider the way they doing a the thing. Even if the way they're doing it isn't getting them the results God promises. So they keep doing the thing the same way because in their mind it's right. They think time is their issue when their tactic is their issue. They think they're waiting on God to change some things and God's waiting on them to make a change. He says their way seems right to them. They won't reconsider their ways. So they're not getting what God promised relationally. Surrounded by liabilities, no assets. Oh, I got you next week. Come back, I got you on that next week. We talk about smart, what Proverbs says, smart moves about relationships. Yeah, everything that Solomon says about relationships is assuming you know the difference between an asset and liability. As iron sharpens iron, he's assuming you know the difference between iron and plastic. If not, you're iron rubbing up against plastic and surprised when you're not sharpened. So it's like, okay, I keep doing this this way. Because somebody on earth told me this wise. Somebody wrote a book about it. Come on. So I keep doing it this way and it's not giving me the results that I want. And if I refuse to reconsider my ways, I'm not calling your names. God's not calling your names. Solomon just says that person <laughs> who is demonstrating that kind of behavior it's a fool. They are self-reliant, so they don't realize they've been created for interdependence. You've been made eye, ear, body. What does that mean? Somebody eye, somebody ear, somebody a nose, 1 Corinthians 12, 13, 14. So it means that somebody else got something you need. But they're self-reliant and self-deceived. So they're wrong, but they don't know they're wrong. So they will fight you to stay wrong. <laughs> well, who, let me go to this side. Y'all, who, who's? No, okay. Who, they're self-reliant, self-deceived, and stubborn. 
So their stubbornness won't allow them to reconsider where they need to make an adjustment. They are unaware of the principle of improvement, which says you will not experience improvement if you won't make adjustments. You can't improve a relationship if you don't make adjustments. You can't improve mental health if you don't make adjustments. You can't improve spiritual health if you don't make adjustments. Watch this. Some elevation requires reconsideration of the way I'm doing a thing. Do you love the way or do you want the result? <laughs> but the wise, come on, the way of the fool seemed right to them, but verse 15 says, the wise, listen, pause, the wise, Pause. The wise listen. Solomon is assuming here the wise know who to listen to. The wise listen to advice. Not just any advice, godly advice. So it means you got to be willing to separate the advice from the person because sometimes it's a good person, but they're giving you bad advice. Can I take it a little further? Sometimes they are a godly person in terms of their moral compass, but they can teach you to live right ethically, but they can't teach you to live well practically. Y'all miss what I just said there. So the question isn't just are you godly, is it do you have godly advice in that area? Because everybody is rich and poor in godly wisdom somewhere. The purpose of this series is to expose where am I poor in godly wisdom and to shift from earthly wisdom to godly wisdom in that area. And some people are receiving, receiving advice from godly people in an area they're poor in. It's like you can pray, so you can talk to me about prayer. Let me go up here. But I got to go somewhere else for my relationship because that doesn't seem to be working out for you. Let me go over here. I'm not judging you. I'm just saying, but teach me how to speak in tongues and I'm listening. But when you start teaching me how to keep a man or keep a woman, I got to go somewhere else because God's still working on you with that. You are a godly person. You're not rich enough to help me there. So I need godly advice. The way of the fool seems right to them. But the wise listen to advice. So I need godly advice. And, 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 and here in Proverbs, Solomon offers some godly advice that exposes us to some areas where we may need to reconsider if we're making smart moves. I got six points. But because I sent you that video this week, I'm not rushing. So I'm going to give you three today. And then I give you the other three next week. Huh? I might, I might have nine. I might spend the next week giving. We'll, we'll be done with Proverbs whenever the Holy Ghost say we done. Okay? That's it. All right. We free indeed. I'm free. All right. So, so here's an area. Here's one of the areas where, where Solomon offers some godly advice. And we may need to reconsider if I'm living with earthly wisdom or godly wisdom here. Number one, am I making smart moves with my words? Now, let me tell you what the Bible says about words. Because words are weighty. They carry weight. The Bible says the tongue, this is Solomon, the tongue has the power of life and death. Is that it? And those who love it will eat its fruit. Now, what does Solomon say? The tongue has a power of life and death. One translation says the power of life and death is in the tongue, and they that love it will eat the fruit thereof. What does fruit have to do with a tongue? 
unless Solomon is using an agricultural analogy to show you how words work. The same way a seed in a garden produces fruit. My words produce fruit that I have to eat. So this is a different spin on eating your words. Come on, come on. They that love it will eat the fruit up. Here's what Solomon is saying, family. Here's what he's saying. He's not saying that our words create things in life. He's saying our words create things in us. It creates attitudes in us and it drives our actions. And so my attitude and my actions is what actually produces the fruit I'm living with. So the power of words is not just what it does out there. The power of words is what it does in here. It's giving me life or it's giving me death. It's giving my joy life or it's putting my joy to death. It's giving my peace life or it's putting my peace to death. It's giving my faith life or it's putting my faith to death. Now, if you will indulge me and we can be Pentecostal for seven seconds, then I'll go back to my little Sunday school lesson. I just want to say one word to you and that word is live. Live. My words are creating life or death. Now here it is, it's bringing life or putting to death something in me. Now, no condemnation, just a challenge. I'm gonna ask you a question, but it's a question for your reflection. Don't answer, just think. If you honestly evaluate the way you talk to you, the way you talk about you, and the way you talk about life, are you making smart moves with your words? <laughs> Somebody said, ouch. No condemnation, just a challenge. I struggle with this just like everybody else. Here it is. When you think about, what is it? Joy unspeakable, full of glory, which is what the scriptures promise to those who live life the king's way. Peace that passes all understanding. So a state of peace that, that, that is not logical considering my circumstances. Right? So joy unspeakable, full of glory. Based on the way I talk to me, should I reasonably expect to have that? I need to consider my ways. Is it illogical for me to audit the way I talk to me and about me and expect me to be full of life, full of joy, full of peace? It's not a smart move. So the question is, okay, not just what we shouldn't do, but what should we do? What is a smart move when it comes to reconsidering my ways with my words? And what the Bible puts and lays before us is a, what I am calling unashamedly a biblical spiritual discipline or spiritual exercise. PD, where you get that from? Paul tells Timothy, exercise yourself into godliness. Gymnasio, exercise. So if you want to grow in godliness, Timothy, you have to do spiritually what people do in the gym. So nobody just walks in the gym and never picks up a weight and then go look in the mirror. So I can't just walk in the church. I can't just walk in the church, never pick up a weight, and expect to be strong spiritually. So what are the spir spiritual disciplines or spiritual exercises, right? So when I pray, I'm lifting. And sometimes it seems like lifting not working. Woo! But give it some time. Keep on lifting. When I read the Bible, I'm lifting. And sometimes it feels like I left the scriptures and I don't know what I just read. And sometimes I read the Bible and I say, I didn't just read it, it read me. But give it some time. Keep on lifting. Praising God and worshiping God. And these are spiritual disciplines. But here's the issue. Have you ever seen somebody in the gym that's big up here? <laughs> But them legs, though. <laughs> they keep skipping leg day. 
because they keep doing the common exercises. And so just like people can be that way naturally, we can also be that way spiritually when there are exercises in Scripture that we ignore. And one of these exercises that's ignored is a biblical practice called confession. You can't even access salvation without this. I got to confess. I got to believe in my heart, confess with my mouth. My heart and mouth have to be in agreement that Jesus is Lord. Is that what Paul says? Now, didn't I teach you last week, Yahweh, Jehovah, what that means? So the con this is what's called, Alan Hirsch calls, a Christocentric monotheism. Yes, sir. What that mean? Don't even worry about it. Here's <laughs> this is what it means. This is what it means. It means Paul is saying, remember, the Lord's my shepherd, remember? Capital L-O-R-D, that's Yahweh, Jehovah. Paul is saying your confession must be Jesus is that person. Okay. Not just Jesus is boss. That what Yahweh was in the Old Testament is personified in Jesus. And when I say Jesus, I no longer have to say Jairus, Shalom, Shama, Rohi, Rapha. Because when I say Jesus, I just said healer. When I say Jesus, I just said sanctifier. When I say Jesus, I just said deliverer. God has exalted him and given him a name that is above every other name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that he is Yahweh. He Yahweh. Confession. He's not just some cool dude, he Yahweh. That's him. Confession. Now here's what it means. I like to give y'all receipts because sometimes, here's how I know it's, you don't, this is your whole life, spirituality should be the most important part of your life, but it's not your whole life. So you trust in people who stand from platforms to give you accurate, accurate information. Does that make sense? So I get that. And so sometimes it kind of hurt me because I'm all, I always want to do my best. I know everybody else wants to do their best, but sometimes what you're getting is not the best. And uh, so I, I won't give you receipts, right? Acts 17, 11, that when Paul spoke to the Bereans, they studied themselves to see if those things which he said were true. I got receipts, okay? Because sometimes people, they like give these definitions that are not rooted in the etym etymology of a word. So they're giving you their interpretation instead of what the word actually means. Right? I've been listening sometimes and somebody's quoting something in the Old Testament and they say, the Greek word for this is, it's like, bro, that's the Old Testament. It wasn't written in Greek. Wow. Unless you're talking about the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Bible. Old Testament is written in Hebrew. Except for about five chapters in Daniel, which are in Aramaic, but it's Hebrew. So you give me a Greek word for Old Testament scripture. But we don't know, like the body doesn't know, so we like, mm, woo, that's deep. I'm like, that's just wrong. Study to show yourself approved. A workman that needs not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So New Testament is written in Greek. So here's, here's what the word confession actually means in the Bible. Let's just look at the etymology of the word. Let's not come up with a definition. What the word mean? This is going to be, it's in my notes on the change app. Here it is. The word confession is a synthesis of two words. It's the word homo and the verb form, which means homos, which means same, the verb form of the word logos, which means to speak. So it means to say the same thing. <sighs> say the same thing what? That God says. It means that I am agreeing with what God says. So this applies even to the confession of sin. When somebody says, when it says confess your sin, it means look at my behavior. And I might be like, I think this is all right. I think I should be able to do this. I think I should have been able to tell them exactly what I felt because they deserved it and they just need to be completely told all the way off. But I'm going to say the same thing about my behavior that God does. So I'm going to confess that what you said and what I did, God, are unaligned. I got to go. Y'all all right? I said, are y'all all right? 
Here it is. So confession in the biblical sense is the act of speaking or declaring what one believes in alignment with God's truth. It is different than cultural affirmations because affirmations are positive, but that doesn't mean they're true. I am strong. Not today. Hi, Paul, the apostle Paul said, when I'm weak, that's when I'm strong. Sometimes I'm weak and I need his strength. Come on. So here's the way, here's the way Paul talks about this. He says, I believe, therefore I have spoken since we have the same spirit of faith. We believe and therefore also we speak. So it's me speaking what I believe that is in agreement with the word. Can I go here? Because God doesn't back up my word. No, 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 pastor, you are wrong. Because the book says I can call those things that be not as though they were. Now, is that what the Bible say? Or is that what somebody told you the Bible say? Well, let's look at what the Bible say. In Romans chapter 4, which is where this scripture comes from, 417, Paul is talking about justification by faith, and he's using Abraham as an example. And he's quoting this. He says, I have made you a father, listen to this, to many nations. He is our father, talking about Abraham, in the sight of God, because he's the father of faith. This justification by faith. He's our father in the sight of God in whom, in whom he believed. So Abraham believed in God. God who what? Gives life to the dead and calls things into being that were not. Let's read it again. God who gives life to the dead and calls things into being which were not. Read it in the King James. It reads the same way. It's not. It is God who calls things into life and calls things that be not as though they were. God is the one that calls things that be not as though they were, not us. He doesn't back up my word. He backs up his word. Now, if I'll, if I'll use his word and put his word in my mouth, then he'll respond not to my word, but his word. For my word will not return to me void, but it will accomplish all I sent it out to do and it will prosper the thing wherein I sent it. So it's not if I say it, it's did he say it? So I gotta say what he said. Smart moves with my words. I'm done. Tess, I'm done. <laughs> Number two, smart words with my reputation. A good name is more desirable than great riches. Now, this land's different because the man who wrote this had riches. So if he didn't have riches, it would be one thing. You'd be like, uh, you're just saying that because you don't have no riches. He's got riches, and he says a good name is more desirable than that. To be esteemed better than silver or gold. Listen to this. No one can control what your reputation's like. You can't control that. A lie don't care who tell it. And people are more interested in lies than truth. We live in a culture where lies are more profitable than truth. You can't control that. So if you're trying to control the way you're perceived by everybody, you're, exercise, you're engaging in an exercise in futility. That's not what this is speaking to. You can't control what they say. You can control whether or not it's true. And what this does is this is more desirable than resources. It opens doors that resources can't open. Solomon says this because he knows the only reason his father became king was because of his reputation. When Saul was being tormented by an evil spirit, back in those days, the way they dealt with moods was like, let's get some music to change the mood. And him and his cabinet are having a conversation and somebody in his cabinet says, hey, let us find somebody that can play instruments for you because these, you're being tormented by all of these different moods. And then there's one person in verse 18, 1 Samuel 16, verse 18, it says, and one of his servants says, like the text doesn't even tell us the person's name. It just says one of his servants. So they, 
says, hey, I know a guy. He's Jesse's son. This man is, uh, he is, he is a cunning player on the heart. He is skillful. He is a man of God. He, he is, a, a, he, he, aesthetically, he takes care of himself. He's brave. He's a warrior. He's articulate. Because all of that was needed for that room. And that's how David got the opportunity to utilize a gift. The reputation, the gift was ready for the room. The reputation was the key that opened the door. So you can't control this, but you, you and I, we can't control it. I can't control nothing. People can take something. I say, cut up. I can't control that. You can't control that. Does that make sense? So that's an exercise in futility. That leads us to a spirit of anxiousness. That's not what our next series is going to be on arresting anxiousness. Listen to me. Listen to me now. So I can't control that, can I? You can't control that. I can't control that. Let me see how I can say this. And there are going to be seasons because all of us are imperfect. There are going to be seasons where we've done some damage to our reputation. The question is, do you believe your mistakes are sovereign? God will not only redeem your life, God will redeem your reputation. Because Moses had a reputation in Egypt as being a murderer. But God redeemed his reputation, sent him back to Egypt, and his reputation now is a deliverer. There's a woman named Rahab who was a call girl in Jericho. Y'all aren't talking to me now. And she helped spare some Israelites' lives and gave them victory in Jericho. And in one chapter of the Bible, she's known as a call girl. And But when Matthew writes in the New Testament, and he's writing to a Jewish audience trying to convince them that Jesus comes from the lineage of David, he starts talking about genealogies and he says this in verse number five, Salmon the father of Boaz whose mother was Rahab. Wait a minute. Salmon the father of Boaz Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Wait a minute. Salmon was the father of Boaz. Ruth Boaz? Yep, that one. Uh, Ruth Boaz had a father named Salmon and his mother was Rahab. If you're willing to keep living, they'll be calling you one thing in the book of Joshua, but calling you another thing in the book of Matthew. Live until Matthew. Survive until Matthew. but I got to make smart moves with my part. How am I handling people? How am I handling business? What am I posting? Do I have a I don't care attitude about stuff I should care about? Because I don't know what Saul and them are talking about. Ah, yeah, yeah. They can be talking about me and not talking to me, talking about an opportunity they're getting ready to give me. I need to make smart moves. How am I presenting myself? Because Saul got options. Smart moves, words. Smart moves, reputation. Smart moves, resources. Proverbs eleven twenty five: A generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. I need you not to be afraid of the word pos- prosper. Because this word has been captured by two schools of thought. One's called the prosperity theology movement, which disproportionately emphasizes health and wealth as signature signs of God's blessing. If that's the case, you gotta say Mother Teresa not blessed. If that's the case, we gotta say our grandmama, some of our great grandmothers weren't blessed. That's an extreme and often wherever there's extremism, there's error. Then there's the other side which is really something that is a theology infiltrated with something called Gnosticism, which is really more Greek than biblical. So it's this adverse agitation and irritation toward anything that's physical. So that leads to poverty theology. 
which inaccurately presents poverty like a virtue. When in the Bible, it's never rich, poor, rich, right, poor, wrong, poor, right, rich, wrong. It's good and evil, period. And you can be a good, rich man like Joseph of Arimathea, right? Right? And you can be a bad, poor person. So, I need you not to be afraid of that word because it means to be abundantly supplied. Proverbs 3. Barns filled with plenty. That's overflowing with new wine. So when God says a generous person will prosper, that sounds like magic. Make it not be magic, PD. Well, in Proverbs 3, we read it last week. It says, your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. Do, do we think that that means that if we're generous, God's, God, it, for them, he was going to blow crop into the barn? Nope. You just wake up one day and there's the crop? Nope. But what does it mean? It means he will rain on their work in the field. I don't have time to bother this. That no matter how hard you work, if he doesn't make it rain, you have no fruit. He says, but I'm going to bless your work. I'm going to make it rain on your work. When you start working, I start making it rain. When you start working, I start making it rain. And then the crop that come up from your work. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of the sinner, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in it does he meditate both day and night, and he will be like a tree planted by the river of the water. His leaf will not wither, and whatsoever he doeth will prosper. What you do, what you do, what you do will prosper. God's not a genie. What you do. But here's what's important. There are people who aren't generous, who have field barns, but their vats don't overflow with wine. And wine's a metaphor for joy. Externally blessed, internally empty. And if you pour in heart, if you pour emotionally, then all you got is some money. And if all you got is money, I feel sorry for you. God says, I can make it rain where you're dry. Wherever there's a drought, I can make it rain. Through generosity, because he says, this is the way you, God doesn't force his area into himself. But behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man open, I come in. He forces himself into no area. We don't want him in. You can be saved and say, I don't want you in my relational, in the relational area of my life. You say, okay, well, go ahead on be on Nicolio. Do you? You're going to be back to me, though. You threw me away for them. You'll be back. When it's not working, when that heart's broken, you'll be back. And this is why we teach and we believe in the principle of tithing here. And whenever I teach this, somebody push back and say, no, that's the law. The law is Edic, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. A specific set of rules and circumstances, specific set of rules and regulations given to a specific people for a specific time period until it's fulfilled by Jesus. In the law, you can have shrimp, bacon, ham. If you got on Polly and Esther, you're out of order. No jewelry, no tattoos. And I'm like, if you steal, we cut your hand off. Eye for an eye, two for a tooth. There were moral laws, civil laws, ritualistic, ritualistic law, purity laws. That's what Jesus fulfilled. But a principle is a universal truth that God expects his people to perform because it's a best practice for all history. So when I teach generosity, I never use the law because it doesn't start in the law. I taught you last week, it started in Genesis. Abraham did it. You say, that's an isolated incident where his grandson did it. Then the law mandated it. So it's a principle. Killing was wrong when Cain killed Abel. That's before the law. Then when the law was written, Moses said, thou shalt not kill. So talking about murder there. He's not talking about self-defense or what Augustine calls just wars. The word there is murder. Got me? Okay, here's the issue. Was killing wrong in the Ten Commandments? So would I be logically irrational to say because it's seen in the law, it's okay for me to kill now? 
Because it was wrong before the law. It was wrong during the law, which means it's wrong after. So I see the principle of the tithe being worked before the law. Mandated in the law. After the law. Someone said, no, 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 no. Well, it shouldn't be a percent. It shouldn't be that. Okay, fine. New Testament PD is grace given. Fine. Why do we automatically assume that means less though? That show me our motive's not right. Why doesn't it, if it's give as I've been prospered, why isn't it more? I need God to make it rain. And I watched him do it. From being an intern at Princeton Seminary, getting $75 every single week and shaking right now a $7.50 check. I watched God make it rain. From sitting with a financial advisor named George Thompson at 26 years old at the Hyatt Regency in Princeton, New Jersey. At 26, a man who was an atheist but got in an accident. He worked for Smith Barney and gave his life to God and started using the rest of his life to teach people biblical financial principles. And he says, if you'll do this for the next 20 years, you'll be able to take care of your family and shift generations. I'm 45. I started at 26. Pay God, pay yourself, live on the rest. Since I was 26. Pay God, pay you, live on the rest. Since I was 26, I've watched God make it rain. It's wisdom. So I'm remixing our wisdom challenge. For those of you that are part of wisdom challenge, the wise up challenge, I'm sending you Every Sunday that we're in this series, I'm going to send you a week's worth of affirmations that I wrote that came from the Bible. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, I'm sending you an affirmation for every week. You're already, if you're already in it, you don't have to re-sign up. This is nothing different. If you aren't in it, you can choose to sign up. I'm going to send you that every week because I need us to start practicing getting smarter with our words. And I don't just give you a positive, cute statement. I give you the scripture that back it up so you can research to see if the affirmation I, or the confession I gave you is based on scripture. I want you to have receipts. Trust the word. So keep studying Proverbs. If you get through with Proverbs before I end this series, read it again. Keep studying Proverbs. Say those affirmations. And some of us need to test God. I need to sow seed. Here's the one place in the Bible where God say, test me. This is not on me, this is on God. He said, just try, I'm just saying, try it. And he said, see if I will not open the windows of heaven and pour you out blessing. There's not room enough to receive. Father, I want to love nothing you gave me more than I love you. All that I have and all that I am is because you gave it to me. And whatever you have, you are one sickness and one lawsuit and one rumor away from you need him to rebuke the devourer. I'm praying for this. Y'all know there's something called the spiritual gift of wisdom? Just look it up. 1 Corinthians 12, 13, 14. Look it up. Father, I pray that this is the wisest season of our entire life. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I love you. We'll see you next week. Hey, well, listen, I hope you enjoyed that message, man. <laughs> and I hope you were challenged to make smart moves. And I'm, I'm asking, I'm believing by God's grace, uh, that's going to happen for me and it's going to happen for you. May this be the wisest season of your life. And if your heart is stirred and you want to sow back into the field that you're harvesting from, you want to bless the ministry that's blessing you, ways to give are on the screen. We love you. See you next time. Take care.